So hello, my name is Martin and I've been basically working on machine learning and security for the last 15 years or so together with my team. So we are all co-founders. There is no one who calls himself just founder. And uh, what I want to share is my experience with startups and research because I did enough of both. The, who we are, basically, well, we started research in academia in 2005 when we were already working for US DOD projects. And we had a choice between optimizing missile delivery, which means killing as many people as possible with minimal number of missiles, or doing network security. There are three companies in the same field just went bankrupt and out of business. So we still picked network security and we decided that that was the way to go. And we spun off from the university and built a startup called Cognitive Security, uh, got VC funding by Credo Ventures as their first ever investment and got bought by Cisco in 2013. And since uh, then I spent a couple of years in Cisco. Uh, I was there with Tomasz Pevni, who's I guess on the call as well. So he was one of the other fa like founders and early members of Cognitive. And when I was leaving uh, two years ago, we were at 25 million users and the team is now at 50 million users globally. So it's still growing very in a very healthy manner. The team behind Resistant AI is very technical. Uh, most of the co-founders have PhDs. So over so many years, we finished our PhDs. Together, we have hundreds of patents and papers in AI and security, and we published in conferences and journals. And one thing that we believe is being transparent and fair. So we never promise something we can't deliver. We always give straight truth to the customer because even if we may lose some customers early on, we keep the customers we have for years and they don't leave. Which helped us to get backing of funds like Index Ventures, Credo and Seedcamp for the new startup, Persistent AI, which is very bluntly protecting AI and machine learning from humans because uh, machine learning is currently very vulnerable, very fragile, and you can easily steal plenty of money by attacking machine learning models that are deployed in financial domain, which is exactly what we do. We are growing very quickly. Right now we have 28 people in the company up from 12 a year ago. And if anyone wants to try an internship or a job with us, we are very open to taking new people on if you can fit with the culture. So let me talk, give you my subjective view on startups. First, I believe that to make a successful startup, you need to foot, fit into a disruption. So there needs to be a change in the world around you, which allows you to build something successful in the place that didn't exist before. It could be technology change or it could be a market change. And the only constant for a startup to be successful is that there needs to be some change, which means instability. And then you have a look at the startups from US perspective and European perspective, which is actually way different. In the US, startups always start from the market. So a group of people who know some market, they know the problem, and then they set out to solve the problem. They don't care about technology at the beginning. They don't care about the means of solution. They really care about the market and the product. And in the last moment, once they can't do it anymore, they can't stand it, they start investing into technology. In Europe, it's a very different. And my example is included in that. You start at the university. So most of us around here, like guys at Rossum, ourselves, we started at the university you have some kind of technology that you want to build or you are already building as I did. Then you slowly turn the technology into product. And I can tell you funny stories how we showed histograms to users in the network operation centers and we were shocked they didn't like it. And that was my first GUI that we have written as researchers. And after that, even when you build a product and you have a couple of users, you start to test whether there is a market where someone wants to use this and whether you can actually make money. And that's basically what gets Europe where we are right now, which means we have only a fraction of global investment in startups and only a fraction of success. 
really good analysis of that comes from Nicolas Collin, who's a French investor and administrator. And this is a brief summary of one of the blog posts he has written. By the way, if you run a startup, it's a really good thing to read. And one thing he says, and this is, I don't always agree with Nicolas, by the way, but it's really good to read opinions of people where you don't agree with everything they say, because that helps you grow. So in his opinion, people who start startups in Europe need to understand that technology is not the same thing as innovation. The fact that you have the best algorithm around doesn't mean that you will achieve something meaningful for the world. As Petra has said a couple of minutes ago, the fact that you improve something by 2% doesn't help you to win in the market. No one notices. Second opinion is that startups don't need to bother with research and development because they typically change their focus, objective, or the problem before you can finish the R&D activity on a strategic scale. So again, talking cheap, but uh, let's say that the unstable environment changes stakes quite dramatically. And R&D matters, but only for large tech companies that can put it into business and turn it to money. It's the turning to money part of the startups that is really problematic. You can do any kind of R&D you want. If you can't monetize it, it's a waste of your time and effort. There is one exception, and that's what's typically called biotech exception. And in biotechnology, you always, always, you always know you have a customer and you know how many, because you basically make people's lives better. You know how many people they are and you, many, you know how many people do have certain illness. So if you can cure that illness or solve an issue, you have a market. The success rate of startups in biotechnology is still less than 1%, meaning less than 1% of them don't go bankrupt. But those that don't go bankrupt make huge amounts of money and they return the investment. Because big pharma companies have, with few exceptions, stopped doing research. The way how everything works is that you build something as a startup. You have 99% chance of failure. Then if you succeed, you sell that startup to a large company that makes 10x money with your technology. And that's what is actually deep tech in software. That's how broad works. And uh, if you look into how European Union supports startups, they support technology and collaboration between university and small companies, which in this view is completely nonsensical. You shouldn't do that because there is no way how you invest into a strategic research project done by the university, with some exceptions, because we are actually investing into one with Václav and Vitek who are on this call, and make money on the scale of a small startup. It's a non-trivial issue because the ROI, return on investment, is not big enough. And that's why Silicon Valley companies love technology investments by European governments, because they end up picking up most of the return and most of the money that comes out of those investments, because they have a machine that turns that technology into money. So is this view of Nicola Collan true? So let's see our own experience. Cognitive security was a deep tech startup. We had massive investments into R&D. We had substantial US and Czech government funding. And still, we can say in the hindsight that about 60% of research efforts spent before Cisco acquisition was basically ineffective. And it was never used or it never made money in production. We invested massively into building peer-to-peer -peer optimized system that was really great for battlefield use except there was no battle, luckily, to be fought between technologically advanced adversaries on the actual battlefield. Everything moved to the cloud, which means that all of the self-configuration research we did was irrelevant because we could manage everything in the cloud and managing something directly is much cheaper than writing AI code to manage other AI code. So that's basically a huge change. You can easily see yourself made irrelevant by a change that's getting, that's happening next to you, in this case, appearance of cloud. Second, political influence. Snowden leaked his discoveries and suddenly all of the internet traffic started to be encrypted 
So basically in two years, we went from 20% encrypted to 20% non-encrypted. And at that point, I had to stop all of the research projects going in that direction and started doing completely new research about breaking encryption or analyzing encrypted traffic, because that was what it's. And third thing, corporations are essentially machines built, or tech corporations, machines built to make money out of technology research, which means that most of the research you do as a scientist in a big corporation never gets deployed. Because it's very cheap to do research. You have 10 or 15 ideas, you let them fight, and then you pick one which you may put on the market because you, you have only so many things you can build on the engineering, marketing, and sales level. So that's the real benefit for the research in corporate environment. You can do it, but unless you have a way how to get it to the market, it doesn't matter. It will never get used. And still, with all of these, it matters. Because if you take a technology that's built by a couple of guys in Prague and deploy that to cover 50 million seats of users in large corporations, you make plenty of money because you have the scale. And at that point, you can really afford to lose and write of 80% of research if you have a good results in those remaining 20%. And that's what have actually happens in a big corporations. So as I said, we were bought in the economically same model as big pharma companies by small pharma startups. Our technology was used to make plenty of money at scale, which we could never achieve as a small startup at that point. And we learned how to optimize research investments in a large corporation. So plenty of experiences shared by Petr with Amazon. Actually, I laid them from the other side because I was the one who was telling Petr's uh, to stop doing this because it will never make money. So how to do, what is the economic outcome? First, if you have as a startup more than one uncertainty, you are going to fail most likely. So if you build a new product on a new market with unproven technology, you are going to have very hard time raising money for that because investors don't like two risks, which means if you don't get money, you go bust. In terms of validation, when startups exit, they mostly get bought by other companies or they get IPO'd and they are very lucky. If you get bought by other company and you have a working business with slightly worse technology, you get much more money out of that than perfect technology with no business. And I saw that I was on the acquiring side when Cisco was buying other startups and this was exactly what was in the Excel sheet. Because the value of the risk is much lower in the case you already have a working business and you saw and you can show people paying money for what you do, even if the efficacy is 2% lower. Big companies can deal with research necessary to push those 2% up. They can't deal with building the machine that makes money out of that innovation. And as I said, big bio research is an exception to that. So what to do? How to run research in a startup? First, forget everything you learn in academia. Because time horizons are different, you iterate over, you don't plan, you iterate, and every three months you do something completely different, at least in our experience. In academia, you want to something to run once on one data set so that you can publish at an IFPS or at some other conference. So you need code that's super fragile, super optimized. And if you give it to someone else, it will run on exactly the same data you had once and give him the same numbers. So it's replicable. This is not the kind of code you can put to production. It would kill you immediately because you need much more robust code because you are dealing with, in our case, criminals that actively try to avoid being detected. So they try to break your code intentionally. You should consider whether you publish because putting something to production is actually easier than publishing that at a conference. So as a startup, in the second startup, we stop publishing because we don't see the ROI simply. And you should consider whether you should publish because as a startup, one of the few reasons why to do research is building a competitive advantage over the others. If you share everything you build without protection, it ends up not being a competitive differentiation. 
and patents don't patent like disruptive ideas because typically you can't defend those ideas what you should patent if you want to invest your money into that which is highly questionable is efficiency improvements so if you have something that makes you on the market 10% uh, better than the other it means you are going to win more business and make more money that's much more important than preventing others from getting into the market at all so these are my experiences and I apologize if I went over time. Thank you, Martin. Thank you a lot for your presentation. Um, so uh, ask, please ask questions. There are already three questions in Slido. And we'll start the first one. Uh, we're afraid to do a security startup when there is a big market of big whales as Cisco Avast asset. So at that point, well, Cisco was the biggest security company when we were starting. It was making about billion dollars a year in security, uh, which now they make about five or six, and the security market increased by a factor of hundred. So I don't. I would say that competition doesn't matter, really. What matters? What about competition between? I'm sorry. Uh, what about competition between startups? Like. Very few startups go out of business because there is uh, they basically lose with competition. It's not impossible in the security market where now we have 2000 security companies, most of them startups. So that's very much possible, but that's not the case of Czech startups. They typically have very good technology and they can deliver if they promise something. Much more common issue is that startups build something that basically is already obsolete. So it's a soft problem that doesn't need to be solved again, or that people don't have a need for. Cognitive security was ultimately successful because of Chinese government program to steal IP in the rest of the world and take it to China. And that increased investment into cybersecurity and made it a huge industry. Okay, thank you. Uh, you said that you have seven PhDs in your team. Do you really think that in order to do research, PhD is required? So I, th I don't think so. The, what you need is a mind that's capable of getting a PhD. You need curiosity, you need inquisitiveness, you need like willingness to explore and try new things and creativity. All those things are necessary. Whether you get a paper saying that or not, it's completely irrelevant. No one ever asked me to show my diploma. I never use it once I got it, I put it to my drawer and that's it. So I would say that PhD is a useless piece of paper, unless you want to have a career in academia, obviously. Uh, it's just also my comment about it. When I see a lot of um, job requirements, uh, it's quite common that they write like PhD required in this domain. So I'm actually, um, I'm thinking that maybe it's obsolete to write PhD required, but actually right, that a required uh, curious mind, like in some different wording, but because a lot of people saying, hey, if I want to work as a researcher, I need to go for PhD and then spend seven years doing PhD and like this may be no result. The uh, very pragmatically, I think that many people push for PhDs to be included as requirements because it gives students to their university friends so that they have a cheap source of labor. And I was a cheap source of labor at one point, so that's reality of PhD studies. If you if you want to get a PhD, do it with the intent of being in the academia and teaching, or doing it for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. But you don't need PhD today to get into startups or into machine learning research. Thank you. And uh, what is your experience of research cooperation between universities and companies? So, actually, very good. Because uh, of the research collaborations I did on Cisco's side. So before that, I was pretty lucky fundraising money when I was at the university from outside. So we basically funded and built a security group with an AIC before I left to Cisco. The, in Cisco, we were funding universities and we were very lucky because about one third of the forward looking academia research worked out which is like a really good number if you look into the forward-looking stuff. 
And because we, we knew how to basically separate people who were just trying to sell us something they already had from the people who were genuinely interested in trying something new in collaboration with us, who were curious. The now with Resistant, we are actually working with university. So we have university collaboration, which I said, or Nicola Collins said is a nonsense because we believe it works, but we actually engage with customers in that collaboration. So it's something where we, as people who know how to do research on all sides of the fence, we sit between the customer and the university, we formulate a long-term research goal that can give us competitive advantage out of what we do with the customer, and then translate this into the university world where you need to have a different criteria. Because we can do this as people who know how to do both things. Okay.